Okay then. So, good morning. I'm so happy to see so many of you both in the room and online. Over the next 30 minutes, I'll take you through what I've been working on over the past eight months. Specifically, I've been working on predicting thermal vulnerability in circuits. But not just any circuits. Specifically, microchips. And for the people in the room who do not particularly know uh, what microchips are, they are chips, uh, they are circuits made on a couple of square millimeters of a material called silicon, which is the key material that makes up sound. Now you can see that the details of such a circuit are incredibly fine. We're talking about details in the order of the diameter of a hair divided by a thousand. So this is not an easy thing to make. And this is also reflected in the design process. You run through multiple steps if you want to design one of these. First, you start with what is called a schematic. The schematic is just an overview of how the components are connected to each other. You can do some hand calculations with this, run computer simulations with this, and get an idea of how the circuit is supposed to work. But you can't manufacture this. To do that, you have to translate this to a layout, which is a daunting task where you take this schematic and translate it to multiple layers of shapes that represent your circuit when it is going to be sent off to the factory. Also notice the brown lines, those are actually interconnections, little wires, little metal pieces. After doing this layout, it can be quite a meticulous task, you run into the next step, which is called tape out. And I put it in red for a very good reason, because it is the most uh, daunting part of chip design. It's the point where you press send, to the and you send your files to the manufacturer and you can't change your design anymore. It takes in the order of three months and a couple of tens of thousands of euros to get a chip produced. So any mistake that you make before this tank out is going to be incredibly costly. After that, you get your chip back, you can start hooking it up to all kinds of measurement equipment, you do testing, and you will find, more often than not, that it doesn't work. Uh, meaning that this is not a linear process. It is a circular process. You have to run through this cycle multiple times. And this costs money, this costs time, this costs even human sanity to some extent, and I would like to contribute to reducing this suffering a bit. There are many reasons for why this suffering can occur, but there's one particular cause that I'm going to look at. Specifically, thermal vulnerability. It's the phenomenon by which a component in a circuit dissipates some power, generates some heat, spreads that heat to other components in the same circuit, and thus influences the overall electrical behavior of that circuit. My question is, can we actually detect that, not in the testing phase, but in the layout phase? Because in the layout phase, we can make cheap, uh, cheap adjustments to this. It's easy to do that. After tape out, it costs a couple of months. Now, there are already um, multiple methods for how you could approach this. The first method is very well established, and it's called finite element analysis. It's where we take a structure, a 2D or 3D structure, and we smash it into little pieces, like this, these triangles over there. The finer the details of the structure, the more of these triangles we need, and the more complex it becomes to compute this. We then take this mesh, as it's called, to compute the physical equation underlying the phenomenon, meaning that this method can be incredibly accurate, but for large circuits with very fine details, this can become so slow that it is just infeasible to use. So I would consider this method for our approach a bit not scalable enough. We can't do this for circuits of thousands or 10,000 components. On the other hand, we have LUMS modeling, where we take the thermal behavior of a chip and we model it using equivalent networks, which works well. It's really fast. One major issue with it, though, is that the component values are a bit arbitrary. If you go into the literature, you will find that different authors use different methods for finding these values meaning that this class of methods is, compared to the finite element analysis, a bit ill-defined. We don't have a strict definition for everything. So I consider these two flaws the major point where I'd like to jump into with this work. Can we create a method for detecting this vulnerability that can destroy the circuit's performance in a way that is device level, by which I mean we can find out if the circuit fails, which component is responsible for this failure, a bit like pointing at a suspect, that is fast, so it runs in little time, and that is scalable. So we can do this for 10 components, 100 components, or 1,000 components. That summarizes, in short, what uh, the goals of this project. Now I'm going to present to you how I tried to uh, approach this problem. I will present some results as a result of that method, 
uh, discuss the assumptions underlying it and the limitations of the method, and finally draw a set of conclusions. So, let's get started. Where do we even get started? Now, a circuit layout tells us a couple of things already. It tells us where the components in a circuit are, it tells us what size they are, and it tells us what power they dissipate if we at least run a circuit simulation. So we will consider this known information for now. Next, we need to think about what it means for a circuit to lose its performance. For that, we need to have some definition of performance, but that definition depends on the function. An amplifier amplifies, thus the gain is that most important parameter there. But it could also be a bandwidth for a filter, it could be a Q factor for a component, and so on. So, to encapsulate this type of behavior, I chose to define this as a blank parameter, which I call alpha. This is just generic circuit performance. Now, the interesting thing is, with advanced circuit simulators, it is possible to already get something called thermal sensitivity, which uh, tells us the thermal derivative of the uh, performance parameter as a function of a device temperature. So it can find out how sensitive it is. For the people who uh, are not familiar with the derivative, think of it more like a conditional statement. The larger this value, the larger you will get uh, a shift in alpha for a fixed shift in Ti, uh, where Ti is the device temperature. Because this is a conditional statement, it doesn't tell us how much alpha is going to shift on the whole. For that, we need something else. And to get an approximation of that, we're going to do that by multiplying that sensitivity parameter by the actual temperature rise of that component. Um, together, we will call this the vulnerability metric. And we can think of this like a, uh, an approximation of how much alpha is going to shift as a result of this thermal effect. Now, this green component, we already know. We, we can find this with existing simulators. What we don't know is the red part, and that's what I would like to zoom in in the rest of this, pre um, in the rest of this presentation. Let's start at the beginning. If we have a layout that looks something like this, we have six components, for example, or is it yeah, seven? Um, let's draw this a little bit differently. Um, let's make them circles for now, to make it easy to read later on. Uh, and we're going to model every single thermal inter uh, interaction. So that's every single unique pair of devices. This is what that would look like. We start with the first component, and we model every single interaction, like this. Then we go to the second component, and we do that again, and we add more of these lines. Then we go to the third component, we do it again. You will already see that this number of internal connections starts to skyrocket. And this is just a network of six components. Imagine what happens for a, uh, to a circuit of a thousand components. In fact, we can already state that the number of interconnections scales with O n squared, which means in practice that if we double the number of components, we quadruple or we get a four times uh, the number of interconnections. So this works well for six, it doesn't work as well for 10,000. So let's not do this. Let's not model every interaction and take a step back. We're going to, from now on, remove the interconnections or the interactions that are not the strongest, but in fact choose the ones that are strongest. We're going to do that in a controlled manner by dividing the group into two classes. The first class is what we call the aggressors. That are the components that are large, they're power hungry, and they are likely to dissipate a lot of heat outwards. On the other hand, we have the victims, which are the remaining components. They are more likely to be influenced by the aggressors. In an example, for example, like this, it would look like this, where we would have two aggressors and the rest would be victims. Uh, then we're going to assign the strongest expected interconnection, which we could do, for example, by spatial proximity. So we're going to assign each victim to the nearest aggressor, which looks like this. It creates these little networks. Um, now, these networks have a very specific structure. They are called star networks. Why? Well, because they always have a center of an aggressor with a certain number of legs. Think of a C star, the same kind of structure. Um, but that doesn't allow us to model those thermal interactions yet. For that, we need something else. Specifically, we need to look at what uh, we use for modeling these heat effects. And we can do that through what we are called thermal networks, which for the people who know circuit analysis is really just electrical networks, but we do a little switcheroo. We switch around the, uh, uh, the uh, quantities and get a similar model. 
So we can replace potential difference by temperature difference, currents by power flow, the ground by the ambient temperature, and resistance in terms of volts per amps by resistance in terms of Kelvin per watt. So you should think of these resistances as how much temperature do we get for a certain amount of power. If we want to model how a certain component will heat up as in a response to power, we can do it with the network on the left-hand side, where we have a power source on the top, it goes down into that resistance, and thus we get a temperature in that node, which is R1 times P1. So it's just Ohm's law, but with different quantities. With this particular knowledge at the back of our minds, we can start modeling the star networks that we just talked about. For a star network of one aggressor and two victims, it would look like this, where we place the aggressor at the center and the victims on the outer sides. Now the top sources here, those are the powers uh, of the three devices. We have three resistances to ground. They model self-heating, which is the capability of a device to get a temperature rise in response to its own power dissipation. And RX2 and RX3, they model the thermal interaction between the three devices. Um, with this particular network, we could find the temperatures of the three devices in the nodes, but for that we need a strict definition of what those resistances really are. And to do that, we're going to do a little bit of circuit analysis. Specifically, we're going to do that by simplifying the network and removing the third device on the left-hand side, and just look at device 1 and 2. We can apply the principle of superposition here and turn sources on and off to get an idea of how the circuit works. So we turn power source 2 off, just let keep power source 1 on, and measure two temperatures at the two devices. And device 1 will measure what we call T11, the temperature at device 1 when 1 is turned on, and temperature T21 at the device 2, which is the temperature at device 2 when 1 is turned on. This notation immediately rings a bell for me with a background in a bit of RF knowledge uh, because this is very similar to many of the matrices that we use in so-called scatter parameters. So why not do this the same way? We could start putting these two values in a matrix. We could do the same thing, of course, by turning power source 2 on and getting two more temperatures in the exact same way. Now, for the simplicity of notation, let's consider this matrix of four entries just one symbol, bold-faced T2 the temperature matrix of victim 2, as we're, I'm going to call it. Now, if you apply a bit of circuit analysis, you can find that the resistance values in this network are actually all direct functions of that temperature matrix, in most cases actually even functions of the determinants of that temperature matrix. In other words, we can fully define a network in terms of these temperature matrices. But this, of course, is just a network of two devices. That's not a star network with 15 devices around an aggressor. But we can expand. We can start, for example, with an aggressor at the center and four victims around it, and define a temperature matrix for every single branch. And then find the resistances of that specific victim branch in the exact same way. The math works out the same way. The uh, equations that I just showed you generalize perfectly well. Um, so with that being said, we now have a fully defined network. We know what the powers are, and we know what the resistances are. The only thing we don't know is what the three temperatures of the devices are. That's what we want to know. But that's what we can apply Ohm's law and Kirchhoff's laws for. In practice, you can simply set up a matrix equation that looks like this, where we relate the inverses of the resistances in the network with the temperatures of the three devices and the three powers. We can simplify this a bit, of course, by writing this as a matrix G multiplied by a vector T equals a vector P, and then because we want to know what those temperatures are, but we don't know what they are yet, but we do know what the powers are, we can invert that matrix to get a matrix R. I'm going to call this the resistance matrix from now on. So with that all being said, we have a completely defined resistance matrix. We can find what the temperatures are. Wonderful, right? Almost. Um, because we don't know yet what those temperature matrices are. The values need to make some physical sense. So we need some source of truth or some source of reasonable truth. And for that, we're going to use one of the methods that I showed you at the beginning of the presentation, the so-called FEM simulation, the finite element method simulation. In practice, what that means is that we are going to define from the side view something like this. This is a piece of silicon with two regions, a region A and a region B. We're going to power region A, so put some power in there, 
and measure what the temperature is in that region. That's what we will call the self-heating temperature, TAA. We can do the same thing, but now powering still region A, but measuring what we see in region B. That's what we call mutual heating. So think of self-heating, the own response, and mutual heating, how someone else responds at a certain distance. Now, we could do this for every leg in every star network, um, but you will quickly find that this is very, very slow. Why? Because every single simulation of this type takes in the order of a couple of seconds. And if we start having star networks that are really large, or many star networks, this is just prohibitively slow. So we're going to do something else. We're going to find those self-heating and neutral heating temperatures as functions of the geometric parameters of this setup. So for different sizes of A and different sizes of B and different distances and positions. And then for every leg in that star network, we can interpolate that data set. So we get an approximation of what we would get with a finite element simulation, but at a fraction of the time, taking the order of five milliseconds as opposed to seconds every time. That gives us a tremendous speed up. But that really doesn't solve everything yet. You see, if we define these regions A and B as rectangular sources, which are most realistic, most transistors, for example, are rectangular sized, approximately, um, that gives us a lot of degrees of freedom. Look at it like this. We have a region A and a region B, and we want to get the two temperatures for every single size and position. That means that we need to sweep over the width and the length of both devices, which are four degrees of freedom, and an offset in the x and y dimension, which are two more. So we get a six-dimensional sweep, which is really hard to run for a reasonable range. My, um, my apologies. Something went wrong here. Um, now, we can solve this in a sim uh, in a, with a bit of a simplification by observing what we see in a, a finite element simulation, which is the phenomenon that thermal spreading tends to be relatively really symmetric, regardless of the fact that this is a rectangular heat source. So what we could do is re uh, replace these rectangular sources by cylindrical sources. Apologies. Cylindrical sources. And with the same volumetric power density. That reduces the degrees of freedom to two radii and the mutual distance, which is three degrees of freedom, much easier to obtain, and doesn't have a significant impact on the accuracy of the method, which I'll show you later on in the presentation. So, there are two very important, I would even say critical extensions to this model. And those have to do with edge cases which aren't really edge cases. The first edge case being, what if a victim lies close to two or more aggressors? We just assign it to one star network, so that doesn't really add to a lot of realism. Well, we can resolve that by introducing a concept called victim sharing, which means that we are going to connect these victims not just to one, but to multiple star networks, if they lie close enough to other aggressors. Secondly, we can introduce the concept uh, where aggress uh, sorry. Um, aggressors, by definition, dissipate the most power in the circuits. So they are going to li be likely to influence each other regardless of what happens. For that, we can account in, a, uh, in an extension called aggressor coupling, which means that we're going to create additional star networks just with aggressors. What you will see is that there is a fundamental trade-off here. The more of these interconnections we add, the more accurate the model will tend to become. But it does come at the cost of runtime, because we make these matrix, matrix problems larger, so we have more computations to run at the same time. So, let's take a bit of a step back, a little bit of a breather. Um, because I've now thrown a lot of information at you, let's zoom out a bit and see what the method is really all about. We start off with the first step, which is converting all of the devices into equivalent cylindrical heat sources. I'm not going to discuss that further in the presentation, but it's important to note that this is a critical step at the beginning. Then, we divide the device set into aggressors and victims. We assign those victims to the respective aggressors. We could also assign aggressors to aggressors with that extension that I just discussed. We compute those equivalent resistance networks with the temperature matrices that we get through interpolation of that acquired data set. We set up the G matrix, invert it to obtain the R matrix, and use that to find the temperature rises. That is the main focus of this work. Now, after that, you can multiply that by the thermal sensitivity, like I mentioned at the beginning, to get an idea of how much alpha is going to shift. And then you can take it even one step further by adding up all of those gamma i's, because they are expected shifts of your performance. 
if that shift like, goes beyond what you expect for your design margin, then my something might be up. And in that case, the gamma i that is the largest is the most likely culprit. That is how this method is structured. And it has a little name that I've given it, uh, and I'm just mentioning it because I'm going to come back to it later. It's called Celeste. Um, specifically because of the Latin word for heavenly, because we are combining star networks. I thought it was really funny when I gave it. Um, so, let's look a little bit about as some results that we obtained with this particular method. The first one, I'm going to show you the impact of this trade-off between uh, connectivity and a bit of runtime, not necessarily, but mostly a degree of connectivity and accuracy. So this is a simple layout of two aggressors and three victims, each with their own position, this is over here, their own radius, and their own power level. What we're going to do here is run this in Celeste and run this in a finite limit simulator for two different cases. We're going to run it for the case where we only model the solid lines connections, which I will call the sparse model, and we are also going to uh, model the case where we include the dotted lines. So one case with fewer connections and one case with more connections and see the impact on accuracy. Now, if we run this, these are the temperatures uh, on the left-hand side from a finite element simulation. And then the two columns after that show you the results from Celeste for both the sparse network and the full network. And what we observe, indeed, is that if we increase the degree of connectivity, we get a smaller inaccuracy, right? uh, an improvement of 5 percentage points. Um, in terms of runtime, we do not see a significant impact because the network is so small. But we have observed for larger simulations with 50 devices, approximately, that you can obtain uh, speed-ups in the order of 20 to 50 times with this particular method compared to an equivalent console simulation. Now, that's all good and well. Uh, I've shown you at least that the connectivity has an impact, but it's not particularly as valuable if we don't know that it works on real silicon. Now, under ideal circumstances, we'd have the resources and the time and the energy to make a complete chip for ourselves um, and measure it. But unfortunately, we didn't have that, so we went for the best next option, which is using an existing chip with uh, patterns, these are the green things, and all of these little pads have a small orange bit next to it. That's a diode. That diode we used as a heat source that we can program. So we connected this to a piece of measurement equipment, injected some currents, and measured temperature rises of the overall chip. How do we measure those temperatures? With a very nice th uh, thermal camera, this one specifically. Um, now, with this particular uh, set up, what, we, what I've done is I've used these two diodes that I denoted and created an equivalent resistance network that looks like this. I did that by turning on one device at a time. So no two devices, just one, and get a characterization using these temperature matrices. And I'm going to show you what the prediction accuracy then is going to be based on that information. If we look at now combinations of power, so turning both diodes on at the same time, we observe a couple of measured temperatures on the two right-hand columns. And now I'm going to compare that to Celeste, where we observe worst-case accuracies for both devices, which are well within 10%, for a method that is, in essence, a linearization of a highly nonlinear material. We could also look at how a finite element simulator would do this for an equivalent characterization of the self-heating resistance, meaning that if, for one device it would behave in the exact same way as the measurements, but then, if we turn both devices on, we get inaccuracies in the order of 70%, showing the impact of the data that we are using in Celeste. If the data is unreliable, like in console here, we cannot expect Celeste to give us reasonable results. So, those are the results that I wanted to show you today, and I'm going to present to you a couple of assumptions that underpin this specific model, because there are plenty. First of all, um, this is a resistance-based model, and resistances are linear components. Uh, meaning that the relation between power that we inject and the temperature rise should be linear as well. Now, what we've done is we've done the same measurements on one device and looked at the temperature rise for um, a certain uh, injected power for uh, the silicon setup that I just showed you. And indeed, what we can observe is that the dissipated power and the temperature rise follow a strongly linear curve, like this. So I do not expect this to be of significant impact on the accuracy of the model as a result of that. Secondly, the assumption of homogeneity and isotropy. 
What that means in practice is that the region is the same all around. It's a bit like a piece of cake. Every single square inch is cake. Um, now, a, piece, a real chip consists of many different regions, different doping levels, pieces of metal. But if we look at the thing with the most impact, it's most likely the doping level. The thing is, however, if you look, go into the literature, you can find that the thermal conductivity is dominated by the material through which most of the heat is traveling. And in our case, that's going to be the substrate below the uh, devices. There are going to be some strongly doped regions at the transistors and diodes, but they will have a very small impact in comparison to the rest of the material. Now, there is one major exception, which is uh, FDSOI, where everything has to travel through a buried oxide layer. In that case, it's a bit like uh, squeezing everything through one resistor. It's going to be the weakest link in our case. But for most bulk CMOS processes, this is not going to be of the most stringent uh, impact on our accuracy. Next, the concept of approximate radial symmetry, which I showed you back when we said that we're going to approximate these rectangular sources by circles. We can actually observe this in uh, this approximate symmetry in a console simulation, which looks a bit like this. It's a lot of information. I'll take you through it. Uh, the y-axis here shows... Uh, wait, sorry. Uh, we have two cases here. We have a square heat source and we have a circular heat source, both with the same volumetric power density and power level. So it's a bit like an apples-to-apples -apples comparison in that sense. What I wanted to look at is how much power flows out of that region at a fixed distance, regardless of, uh, as a function of what angle we're looking at. That's on the x-axis. So we look at the flux, the power flux that's outward, and the angle on the x-axis. And while the patterns are significantly different, they look very different. One is very shocky, the other one is a bit of a, yeah, a bit of a, I would even say a weird staircase shape. Um, if we look at the means of these two particular curves, we see that they lie within half percent of each other. So the shape doesn't really have that much of an impact. In that sense, for moderate aspect ratios, we can thus conclude that is, we're not going to have a major impact on the accuracy to approximate by cylindrical sources. Then we remain with a couple of limitations of the model, which are particles, unfortunately. <laughs> um, first of all, we omit victim-to-victim -victim interactions. That was made deliberately. That is how the star networks work, and it has an impact. It also means that the labeling of aggressors and victims has a strong impact on the accuracy of the model. Secondly, the reliability of the reference temperature data that I just showed you is paramount. If we were to use that console data that is 70% off, you can't expect great results. So you either need a fully calibrated FEM simulator, of which we uh, did with measured data to get realistic results, or we need measured data in the first place. Then uh, I'd like to leave with some topics for future work, because of course there's always more work left to be done. Um, first of all, this model is done for stationary thermal behavior, meaning that everything is at a steady state. It doesn't change anymore. But we could include the concept of thermal capacitance to model time-changing behavior, to see how the circuit settles over time. It is not it's not immediately apparent, unfortunately, how to do this yet. And thus, I would love to see someone expand on this. It's done for self-heating models, but not for this specific kind of model yet. Secondly, uh, the heuristic that we use for splitting these aggressors and victims is of significant impact on the accuracy. There are many methods which we could use. In the method that I found was most accurate for our case was splitting by power level. So the most powerful were aggressors, the weakest were victims. But I don't think that the last word about this has been said yet. Uh, so I'd love to see this expanded in the future. And finally, the concept of this rectangle to cylinder translation, which works well if, we, uh, if, for example, rectangles with a moderate aspect ratio. But what happens if we have resistors, for example, which are very long? Should we replace that by one cylinder? Maybe two? Three? It's not immediately apparent yet. So this could be expanded upon in the future as well. Finally, in conclusion, um, what I've presented to you today is in reality just a hybrid method of combining the pros of a FEM simulation, so the accuracy of FEM simulation, with the potential speed of a LAMS modeling approach, where we have a trade-off that we can make between accuracy and runtime. We can choose for an accurate model that runs slower, or an inaccurate model that runs faster. Um, I've also shown to you that radial symmetry does allow for a bit of simplification, we can reduce the number of degrees of freedom in acquiring this data. And finally, I'd like to highlight explicitly that the results that I've shown to you today are indicative. I've shown you that the assumptions 
are uh, not as unreasonable as I did, if you expect it, but that doesn't mean that this model is uh, fully conclusively proven yet for every single circuit in the world. We need more uh, work to actually show, uh, and make it, uh, show its reliability and make it more reliable through extensions. With that all being said, um, I'd like to close off on uh, saying that I have one big hope for this model. I hope that this model can make chip design a little bit less painful and uh, uh, arts designs a little bit more starstruck. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thomas. And well within time.